Welcome, everyone, to Los Libertinos podcast. I am your host, Carlos Abelard, and this is Chingazos and Fire episode number 30. Our guest today is Andrew Koppelman. He is the John Paul Stevens Professor of Law at Northwestern University. He's won many awards for his scholarship work that focus on the intersections of law and political philosophy. He has read in many books, most recently, Gay Rights versus Religious Rights, The Unnecessary Conflict. And he has a new book that will be dropping later this year called Burning Down the House, How Libertarian Philosophy Was Corrupted by Delusion and Greed. Welcome, Andrew. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you for uh, coming on. And um, usually uh, the way like the, the, the show works is that um, we just assume that my show isn't that big and I'm starting to grow it. And most people that listen are going to be libertarian half, and then the rest are going to be all my primos and aunts and tios and all my family that don't have papers. So they're going to try mm -hmm. to figure out how to get some of this information, but they're not going to know any background on you. So if you please don't That's mind giving fine. a, you know, born and raised. That's the or... story of my life. Uh, there you go. I was born in the suburbs of New York City. Uh, I was, uh, I went to college at the University of Chicago, uh, where uh, I was a Pell Grant student. So uh, that meant that I needed government provided financial aid in order to get my education. Uh, I uh, was out of school for four years uh, doing various things. Relevantly here, I was a newspaper reporter for a while. I think that I also had some experience of uh, an unregulated market. I did a lot of things after college and one that made a big impression on me was uh, I just because I wanted to get out and see the world, I traveled down to Louisiana and did manual labor for a while in the oil industry. And I remember for a while working in a bunkhouse with a bunch of manual laborers. Uh, and I found that quite a lot of the people who I worked with uh, weren't educated. Uh, you know, some, a few of them didn't speak English. And I found that when they calculated our pay, the bosses routinely made small mathematical errors in their own favor. Imagine that. Now, I, you know, and that sort of gave me a sense of what happens in an economy where uh, government isn't watching. Uh, or here, uh, you know, you had these, the workers were disorganized and uh, the, uh, the bosses were cozy with the police. It just strikes me as what not to do. I kind of wish that there was a more aggressive regulatory agency there, but this was Louisiana, uh, and so that wasn't the case. Anyway, I eventually went back to school uh, and ended up getting uh, both a PhD and a law degree at Yale and worked as a law clerk for a judge for a year and then went into teaching uh, because I found that the academic work suited me more than being a lawyer, which was my other option. And so ever since then, uh, this has been my life. I read and write things <laughs> and I teach a lot of people. Uh, and I've been interested in, uh, I guess, you know, the, uh, since quite a lot of your listeners are libertarians, I should say, uh, since my PhD is in political philosophy, I do work at the intersection of law and political philosophy. Uh, I try to argue to people who are interested in policy that political philosophy matters and that it's worth taking your time to learn some. You probably have some already, and it's worth trying to reflect about that. Uh, but the most fundamental thing that I've got in common with the libertarians is that I think people ought to be free to live the lives that they want, that they should decide for themselves what kinds of lives they are going to have. And that that's what we should be aiming at in politics, to allow people to live as they like, that simple. Uh, we disagree about whether big government has any role in bringing that about. I think that big government of the kind that we had in the United States in the late 20th century, to some extent still do, although it's somewhat chastised, uh, is the way to deliver that. Um, in the late 20th century, you had a world with very big government, massive regulatory apparatus, and people reasonably thought that their children's lives were going to be better than theirs were. That's what I want. Fair enough. Um, perfect. Um, so when, um, I politically got started, not like politically, but I got into political like shows through the Bill Marshall, like my parents 
could afford cable. So I got HBO and I started watching uh, Bill Maher. And, uh, you know, uh, my family was mostly Democrat, mostly because they're, the narrative was that Republicans were for the rich and Democrats were for the poor. And at that time we were poor. So mm -hmm. you vote for the, the party that's for the poor. But um, when I started getting into my uh, libertarian ideas through the uh, Ron Paul campaign in 08, um, I was learning about them, watching all the videos, but I was also at the same time, because I was going through a transition in my life where, uh, you know, bad breakup, I was middle twenties, kind of like trying to yeah. figure out where I was trying to find my path. And I was also listening to this like hippie Buddhist commentator guy, like name, uh, his name was Alan Watts. And I, oh, yeah. and, and I liked his teachings and I was listening to Ron Paul. So my, I was woven with a lot of those at the same time. And um, one of my favorite sessions that uh, Alan, Alan Watts had was this one called uh, The Middle Way. And uh, basically it's just a message of, uh, you know, finding balance in, in yourself and finding balance and, and, and seeing how other people live their lives and be sure that you kind of stay kind of centered. But um, you've- uh, Alan Watts was a smart guy. I'm a fan as well. Yes, and uh, you have a, uh, uh, I was reading uh, some of the what you had uh, sent me and you consider uh, F.A. Hayek to be one of the founders of modern libertarianism. Can you yeah. speak to Hayek's forgotten middle way? Uh, so uh, the uh, so to understand, well, modern American libertarianism, it really gets started when Friedrich Hayek writes The Road to Serfdom in 1944. And to understand why that book is important, you have to understand something about the context. In the late 1930s, the world's most admired economic managers were Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler because uh, the depression had devastated most of the world's economy. In the United States, uh, you know, the economy was in terrible shape. Uh, Britain and France weren't a whole lot better. Uh, Russia had always been a rural backwater and it was industrializing. And Germany had you know, only a few years earlier and it had horrible inflation, horrible unemployment. Uh, and it was booming because Hitler was spending all of this money on mil the military and on public works. Uh, and so most people thought central planning is the way to go. What you gotta do is have some central direction of the economy. And Hayek thought that uh, this is just bad economics. Uh, that uh, the uh, nobody could calculate where capital would be invested. Uh, it might be possible to imitate what free market economies did, which was basically what the Soviet Union did. It uh, just took production that had been perfected in the West and copied it. But uh, but you weren't going to be able to grow. Weren't going to be able to respond to people's desires. And this was Hayek's big innovation to say it was it would also be tyrannical you would have to order people around and tell them what to do and stop them from starting new things on their own. Uh, and so Hayek offered, I think, uh, an account that's still quite valuable about what's uh, why a capitalist economy tends to make everybody better off. That uh, there's just, way, the reason why central planning has to fail is that there's way too much information out there that uh, you know, people need to uh, start new, uh, pe people need to be able to uh, start new businesses looking at for, looking to respond to consumer desires that even the consumers don't know about. Uh, I've got sitting next to me on the desk here an iPad. Nobody knew they wanted an iPad. It was only because Steve Jobs was able to take this reckless risk that you were able to get this kind of innovation. But even ordinary things, uh, you know, the, uh, the fruit that is in the supermarket responds to consumer demand. If people want apples and they end up buy, suddenly start buying a lot of apples, the price of apples will go up. And so people will grow more apples and the consumers get uh, supplied. And so I can get an apple that was grown by somebody who I don't know and I'm never going to meet because markets are able to produce that kind of coordination. And no central planner can possibly achieve the level of cooperation that free markets can produce. That's Hayek's big innovation to show that part of what's great about markets is their information managing function, which socialism can never 
reproduce. And also uh, the fact that it leaves people free to produce what they want means that uh, the government's not going to boss people around in the way that it inevitably will in a socialist economy. But Hayek was a lot less absolute than uh, many modern libertarians. Uh, he thought, for instance, that uh, markets uh, are going to distribute necessarily somewhat arbitrarily, and there's going to be a big element of luck in the distribution. If somebody works in a factory and they're 45 years old, and then machinery gets invented that makes their job disappear, suddenly they're going to have to take a much lower paying job. And it's not because they did anything wrong. It's because of what's good about markets, that markets innovate, markets come up with more efficient uh, ways of producing things. So there is uh, some basis for compensating the inevitable losers in a market. And quite a lot of what happens uh, in a free economy sometimes produces effects on people who aren't party to the transaction. If I, manufacture, if I have a factory and the factory is producing stuff that people want to buy, but the smoke is poisoning people in the neighborhood, the cost of the smoke isn't going to be reflected in the price of the product unless government comes along and makes me internalize those costs. So Hayek isn't absolutely opposed to redistribution or regulation, but quite a lot of contemporary libertarianism is. So that's what I think divides the kind of liberalism that I'm in favor of from contemporary libertarianism. Hey, what's up, everyone? Visit buenterprises.com. BU is a company that helps you with relaxation, stretches, and breathing techniques that you can implement in your daily life. I have been using them for over three months now. And even though with the holidays that just passed, some of uh, my classes I was not able to make uh, due to a lot of uh, uh, not having enough time to, to do it, whatever I had learned in previous sessions, I was still able to do them uh, throughout the Christmas and New Year's break. Uh, and I still feel very good. Um, one of the main stretches that I use is in my truck when I'm at a stop sign. That's been a game changer to be able to do some of my shoulder rolls and some of my lower back stretches. And uh, I learned those at uh, buenterprises.com. Uh, so if that is something that sounds uh, appealing to you where you want to try to have a customized uh, program for your, your daily life, visit buenterprises.com, uh, uh, sign up for one of their programs. Be sure to use the promo code CHINGASOS, in all caps, C-H-I-N-G-A-S-O-S, -S, CHINGASOS, for 20% off of your purchase. Um, once you sign up, use them, email me, let me know how it's going. We can exchange some, uh, some, of the, uh, some tips. I want to know how you guys are doing. So uh, please visit buenterprises.com. And use the promo code CHINGASOS, all caps. And uh, I'll see you on the, on the next one. Peace. Yeah, you uh, also uh, mentioned that, um, so basically there was uh, that uh, libertarianism is uh, like an offshoot of uh, liberalism. Yeah. And that the, I guess they have a beef, but basically you kind of describe it as a, a family quarrel. Can you kind of uh, talk oh, yeah. about that? Because if... Um, you know, if I was to tell somebody, oh, you know, libertarianism is 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 a little it's a little primo, a little cousin of liberalism, they're gonna be like, well, well what do you mean? You know, no, no, it's you know, so they so can you kind of uh, get into that oh, a little I mean, bit? First, I gotta get clear on what liberalism is, which is uh, you know, and in in political philosophy, it's not necessarily associated with uh, the policies of Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton. Uh, it is broadly the idea that liberty, freedom, is what we should aspire to, not the triumph of the master race or the triumph of the king or the triumph of the true religion or any of the ideals that the human race has from time to time devoted themselves to, the Roman Empire crushing its enemies. <laughs> Liberalism doesn't care about that stuff. We just want to make everybody free to live as they like. Uh, 
And the disagreement between the libertarians and the other proponents of liberty is a, has to do with whether small government, a minimal government, is the way to bring about liberty, whether we will make uh, people freer if we shrink the size of the government that we now have. So that's so, the kind of family point. We, uh, it is possible for a liberal and a libertarian to argue with one another in a way that uh, you know, I can argue with the libertarian and I can say what you really want, you know, there's actually a better path to get what you want. Whereas uh, if I'm talking to, let's say, a racist, that person and I just can't be friends. We don't want the same things. We want fundamentally different things. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, uh, that type of liberalism, which like, yeah. I guess you call it like classical, right? Or classical liberalism uh, yeah. is the way they phrase it sometimes. And, yeah. But I guess now we, when the, the term basically means like, like political left or uh, yeah. Democrat yeah. and all that. Um, a funny story. Um, uh, I, um, cause you know, I come at this raw cause you know, um, I don't, read a lot of these books like so all these guys that you're talking about yeah, no, i've heard of them the, but i read political philosophy so you don't have to one there of you go, the perfect. aims of this book is for somebody who hasn't read all of this stuff to have in you know convenient you know not very long form all right i'm going to bring you the news you know here is what is going on in libertarianism uh you know i didn't know this stuff myself uh you know i, I I tried to write a book about the Obamacare case, and it turned out it was all about libertarianism. And so I had to learn more about libertarianism. I could talk about that as well. Yeah, that's perfect, because um, that was my uh, next question. It was, yeah. what, what was your first interaction, like face-to-face -face with, liberta uh, with, 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 yeah, with, with libertarianism? Because, because you just said it right now that you were, you were going to write about uh, Obamacare, and you got hit with uh, the, these, yeah. these ideas, you know? Well, so uh, I actually, well, long before Obamacare, I had encountered libertarian ideas. Uh, so one thing that uh, law professors do is uh, they, uh, if they see some injustice in the world, and, you know, I mean, injustice is to law professors as disease is to professors of medicine. <laughs> if we can figure out that there's some of it out there, and we think that there is something that can be done, if people only saw clearly enough to remedy it, you try to make the case. Cause you know, this is all we do as professors. We write articles that try to persuade other people, look what I see, this is what we need to do. Uh, and uh, what our comparative advantage compared with people who are actually out in the trenches is that we've got the time to step back and try to get the big picture and understand. Uh, we don't have other responsibilities, but that is our responsibility. Uh, so when I was a law student, uh, I was a law student in the late 80s, the Supreme Court had very recently dismissed the idea that gay people have a right to privacy in their sexual relations. In the Bowers versus Hardwick case in 86, the court said that that claim was at best facetious. And that made me angry. And I thought, well, that can't be right. Uh, that you know, people ought to have a right to privacy. Uh, and, uh, but then when I looked at the other arguments that were being made by people on the gay rights side, their standard argument was that people should have a right to do whatever they want as long as they don't hurt other people and viol or violate anyone's rights. And way back then, I thought that that was too simple. One uh, thing that it meant was that you couldn't impose any constraints on self-destructive behavior that the corner grocery store would have to be allowed to sell heroin and methamphetamine. And I don't think you would improve people's lives if that were the case. And it also would undercut all of anti-discrimination law because anti-discrimination law forces people into transactions that they don't want to engage in. You know, I don't want to serve you, but the law makes me. That's what anti-discrimination law does. Uh, but I came back to this, and so I offered a different argument, which many years later, the Supreme Court bought that discrimination against gay people is a kind of sex discrimination. That was my student note in 1988, and the Supreme Court uh, adopted it a couple of years ago. Um, but Obamacare, uh, you asked about Obamacare. But hold on, uh, hold on. I have to, uh, but uh, so what did they adopt? When you say adopt, like the idea was that... So, the, uh, so the Supreme Court uh, decided uh, just a couple of years ago in uh, the uh, Bostock case, Bostock versus Clayton County, that if an employer fires somebody for being gay, 
they are discriminating on the basis of sex in violation of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The Civil Rights Act says that you can't fire somebody or refuse to hire on the basis of their sex if an employer fires only uh, their male employees who have boyfriends. <laughs> That's sex discrimination. You're treating similarly situated men and women differently. Uh, so uh, the, uh, I was part of the group that argued that and uh, it, the Supreme Court bought it in a decision by, of all people, Neil Gorsuch. Uh, so this was a couple of years ago. And uh, you know, I remember when I first made the argument in 1988, I was a crank. <laughs> Nobody agreed with me. Um, uh, and when you said earlier that the the gay rights activists were were basically saying that they're using the, the privacy like the privacy yeah, you of, can about do like, what you want yeah th that sounds very libertarian so it is were, very so, libertarian so and because i had reservations about that argument i was already critical of libertarianism <laughs> at okay. least in that strong form but you had mentioned that it was uh simple uh does simple mean that it's it's I, it, well, it doesn't have to like can can some things be just simple or they well they can be too simple okay. uh if i uh, you know i uh you know you want to simplify you want to see things as simple as the world is uh and uh and not simpler if i say don't shoot people uh you know well that seems simple enough and then you know you uh you see the murderer about to hit a baby with a baseball bat and you ask, well, can I shoot him? No, no, no. I already told you, you can't shoot people. No, but wait a second. <laughs> it turns out that it's more complicated. There are exceptions. Um, so the idea, I think, as a general matter, people should be able to do what they want as long as they don't hurt people. But there are, uh, ex I think that there are exceptions. I think methamphetamine gives you one and uh, exception and discrimination is another. And both of those are problems for hardcore libertarians. I mean, libertarians are willing to follow their logic out to its conclusion, but I think that people are actually not uh, free to live as they like if they develop a methamphetamine habit. And uh, it's just, uh, this is a way of being unfree. And if people have all doors closed to them in, in the economy, as discrimination characteristically does, uh, then once again, people find themselves boxed in. Okay, yeah, I understand. Like uh, yeah. uh, you're tr uh, trying to create kind of, not create, but like a backstop or say, uh, you know, the word can yeah. be safety net or something like that, you know, that yeah, term's used around, but. Yeah, and uh, yeah. again, you know, the thing I'm, trying to measure this in terms of one of the questions that political philosophers ask or that you should ask is, well, what is it that we're trying to maximize? What is it that we're trying to bring about? Um, everybody's got a political philosophy. Everybody's got a world that they want to bring about, a world almost always different from the world as it is now, <laughs> something that they're hoping for. And uh, you want to figure out, well, what is that? What are you hoping for? Uh, Ron Paul was offering a vision of the world. Um, so what I'm trying to do is, you know, take that vision of the world seriously and ask, is this really what we want? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Yeah, which is kind of the style that I like. Uh, you know, I, I and getting ready for your interview, I saw some of your uh, lectures at some universities, and yeah, I mean, we don't agree. I don't agree on on some stuff, but. I, I like your style of, you know, mm -hmm. of res being res like respectful of the other side, not, you know, I don't know, there, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a way of the, of, of how some people can carry themselves where their argument can go further by just being like sympathetic or something, you know, kind of like, Hey man, I get your yeah. side, but you know, this is my vision, you know, and it's, you know, it's, it's, so. it's crucial to be able to get other people's sides. One of the thing, one of the things that, uh, one of the aspects of the country that I think has uh, gotten worse during my career is that people are more ready to attribute bad motives to people who disagree with them. And I have uh, talked to people who I radically disagree with. You know, I was debating same-sex marriage for a long time. And, uh, you know, we would uh, travel around the country and do these debates. And, you know, we would 
furiously disagree, and then afterward we'd go to lunch. Uh, and I get to know these folks. And uh, I think generally the people who I am argue with are idealists. They really want to make people's lives better. They have a vision of what a good world uh, would be. They disagree with me, but they are doing the best they can. I am doing the best I can. What are we supposed to do? The only way that we can move on is to try to understand each other and try to understand. I, may, I need to make an honest effort to try to understand why you believe the weird shit that you believe. Uh, and uh, yeah, the uh, and I think that that's you know, one of the things that I like about this job of being a professor. Is that it happens all the time. You know, we go to conferences uh, and we present warring papers and we disagree. And you know, we think you know it's not personal. You call it the way you see it. I call it the way I see it. Uh, you know, I try to come up with a uh, response, and uh, you know, we try to see if we can make it clearer and uh, see whether the people who are watching us argue can learn something. Yeah, the that's... real error. The real enemies are not the guys on the other side. The enemies are ignorance and confusion. Those are the enemies. So um, I, um, when you said, you know, how do you move on or how do you move forward? You know, to me, that's uh, like uh, like an action in, in time, right? Moving forward. Mm -hmm. And and I've always, uh, this this might be a funny story to you to, that, um, you know, I, um, in, in preparing for a previous uh, a guest, uh, I did not know that the, the term like left wing or right wing had to be with like uh, 18th century France and you sat on the <laughs> right wing of the assembly yeah. if you were for the king's powers and the left yeah. side if you were French like against king's assembly. powers. Yep. And um, I always thought it was about a bird. Like I really thought it was about like a bird <laughs> that you just needed two wings to, to mm -hmm. get somewhere. You know, you needed yep. both wings to, f and I remember just like, okay, cool. But, uh, you know, I really thought it was about a bird, but it seems now I, I could still use the, the the vision because to me, I, I, I don't shy, shy away that that uh, that that you need both left and right wing to get somewhere. Um, but it seems like now that, pe you know, if you want to use this bird analogy, people are just cutting off one wing or the other and they're just flying in circles. They're just staying in their own kind of like flying in circles. There is. There is and, a lot to that. And uh, and I, I like guess uh, and I guess I was just saying that because, um, you know, when you were saying that there's no beef to it, I we, we could also maybe also admit that even though uh, there's some flying that's going, it does still tend to be that there's one direction that the government mostly goes. And that is that it is mm -hmm. towards growth or getting bigger. Uh, yeah. uh, rarely yeah. we do. Rarely we do get some cuts and maybe you you can have more specifics on some cuts that maybe weren't necessary or were or maybe some other stuff but you know in general it kind of moves in one direction so it's going to be easier for somebody that likes in general the direction but someone that isn't going in that direction they're going to always be like you know what cut off this wing because mm -hmm. i want to stay grounded because i don't want it to go anywhere you know th there's this there is this kind of yeah. these tensions well, if i can run with your metaphor uh yeah I think that a doctor needs to have a fairly detailed knowledge of anatomy and of what's going on with the patient before he amputates anything. Uh, and uh, sometimes you do. I, you know, and I'm perfectly happy to say, you know, there are aspects of government. Uh, you know, I mean, every few years, uh, the Congress passes this horrible thing called the Farm Bill. Uh, which massively subsidizes corn above all, with the result that high fructose corn syrup is in pretty much everything that you eat, which produces obesity, diabetes, and tooth decay. And, uh, you know, this is awful. This needs to stop. But, uh, and the, one of the most useful things that I think that my libertarian friends do is they point to dysfunctional aspects of government. And a lot of the time they're right. Uh, you know, you read Reason magazine and you will constantly learn about things that government is doing that are stupid or tyrannical or both. And the quality of the staff at Reason magazine is extremely high. They are often right. Not always, but often. Uh, and uh, I admire what they're doing. But 
the way that I got interested in libertarianism and really started to focus on it, uh, just go back to Obamacare. Uh, so way back in 2010, I was invited to give a presentation about uh, the Obamacare litigation. And I hadn't followed it. You know, before then, I, I teach constitutional law. I kind of knew about government powers because you got to cover that stuff in class. But it hadn't been something that I'd written about. Uh, and so I read the two district court cases that had said that the law was unconstitutional. And I became upset because the reasoning was terrible. Uh, that uh, it just was uh, a nonsensical understanding of limits on congressional power. It just, the, uh, the, so in a nutshell, the reason why Obamacare was constitutional was because the federal government gets to regulate commerce. That's in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. And the healthcare industry, which is 18% of the US economy, is commerce. And so uh, if uh, it is not delivering and more and more people were going without health insurance, particularly the poorest and worst paid workers were losing their health insurance in droves, Congress can do something about that. Uh, but the challenge was based on this idea, which I'd never heard of before, that you've got a right not to be required to buy a product. Uh, and the whole challenge was based on that libertarian premise. So uh, there, was, uh, there was a moment in the oral argument that the case where uh, the Solicitor General, the person, the lawyer arguing for uh, the Obama administration, said that, well, government can, it can legitimately make people have health insurance because we're obligated to pay for the uninsured when they get sick. And Justice Antonin Scalia said, well, don't obligate yourself to that. It's just a very strange thing for him to say. I mean, it assumes that there really isn't an obligation to take care of sick people who have no money. Uh, you can choose to obligate yourself or not. And I thought, this is nowhere in the Constitution. How is it that these guys are getting any traction at all? But they came within one vote of uh, taking health insurance away from over 20 million people. And then the Trump administration tried to do it again a few years later. Um, so the, uh, my earlier book, The Tough Luck Constitution and the Assault on Healthcare Reform, tries to argue that this bad libertarian philosophy was what was driving that challenge. After, when I was writing that book, I tried to understand libertarianism. I read a lot of libertarians. For the first time in my life, I read Ayn Rand. I'd never read her before. Uh, every word of Atlas Shrugged. Uh, and uh, I was more horrified by her than I expected to be. And I reread Hayek, who I hadn't read since college. And I liked him better than I remembered liking him. Uh, and so I started writing a paper, you know, just trying to talk about the differences between them, and it grew. Uh, uh, it turned out that uh, what I had to say really was going to need a book. Yeah. So that was a while ago. The thing is finally done. What uh, uh, what about Ayn Rand did you not like? So I've never read any of her books. I watched the, the movie when it came out. Uh, I watched a bunch of her interviews with uh, one of those old uh, Wallace, one of those old uh, anchor guys, uh, and I liked them. Um, but uh, I even used it as a foundation uh, when I told my wife when we were dating why I loved her. When I say why, I mean like when I said it, I, I gave her the whole reasoning. And I use Ayn Rand's uh, kind of way of talking about how uh, values is the currency of love and different things like that. And I kind of just let her know, like, you know, when I'm saying it, I'm not just saying it just to like say it. I'm saying it with a lot of like thought. Like, I mean, I love you. You know, I told her. And it was with some little Ayn Rand background. Uh, was a, what, what is your what is the Ayn Rand beef that um, you got? Um, well, she certainly has, has inspired a lot of people, and uh, I admire some of her writing. But uh, she uh, thinks that uh, so she is a quite extreme opponent of any regulation of capitalism. So uh, uh, just one quote: uh, she says that what any interference in market. Uh, does, it tends to elevate the weakling, the fool, the rotter, the liar, the failure, the coward, the fraud, and to exile from the human race, the hero, the thinker, the producer, the inventor, the strong, the purposeful, the pure. Uh, so any, the picture that you get in uh, her novels is 
magnificently self-sufficient heroes and the despicable moochers and looters who are trying to suppress their genius. Uh, and she's really writing in response to uh, the kind of abuse of power that she herself experienced. She, as a teenager, she lived through the Russian Revolution uh, and the Leninists were incredibly wasteful and tyrannical and stupid. And it's that picture of state power that runs all through her writing. Uh, and, uh, but once you reject it, you say, well, you know, anybody who loses out in the economy deserves it. It would be wrong uh, to do anything about that. So the objection to food stamps or to Obamacare, both of which are about giving people what they need to stay alive, is it's very nice to keep people alive, but you're taking the money away from other people who didn't do anything wrong. And you mustn't do that. You mustn't redistribute other people's money. Uh, so any kind of safety net is illegitimate because people are entitled to their money. Of course, they wouldn't have the money unless you had the large state apparatus that makes it possible to do business around here. Uh, so I think that there's a misunderstanding of property rights here. Uh, people tend to get rich in societies that have high taxes. And in fact, the richest societies in the world all have big states with high taxes. Uh, they're, these are tied together. People are more willing to take the kind of risks that uh, free market economies have if they're told that you're not going to be absolute destitute and ruined if you make a mistake. What's up, everyone? Please visit palomaverdecbd.com for all of your CBD needs. If you need anything to take the edge off during the day uh, to help you sleep at night or just with a little bit of uh, body aches and pains that you might have, um, Paloma Verde CBD carries all types of CBD products that can help you on that front. I use it basically in the morning. I put some tincture drops in my morning juice, uh, whether it's a green juice or orange juice, uh, I put it in my uh, drink. And then I also use it in the evenings to help me wind down, to help me get into sleep. Um, and also I take some of the gummies an hour before I know that I'm going to do an interview. Uh, I feel that it helps me um, just relax a little bit and focus on the task at hand of trying to make myself sound smarter than I am. Um, so if that is something that uh, sounds like it's appealing to you, please visit palomaverdecbd.com. Use the promo code CHINGASOS. That is C-H-I-N-G-A-S-O-S, -S, CHINGASOS. And um, get 25% off any, anything over $75, uh, free shipping. Once again, visit palomaverdecbd.com. It is a business that my wife and I run, and we are very proud of it. And we want to try to help any of you that are looking for some relief. So once again, visit palomaverdecbd.com and get your CBD products. Gracias. Yeah, you were uh, when we first started talking. You talked about like uh, the the market features that uh, that uh, that happen in in capitalism, and what what are the market features that happens in like I guess political ca uh, capitalism, where I guess you know someone on my side might say that oh the state's forced on us, but maybe it's not forced, and the market of people are in agreement with some this size government, right? Like you were talking about Obamacare. I mean, I remember all the arguments back then because uh, I was barely getting more into like, uh, uh, that would have been 09, Obama. So yeah, I remember some of the arguments yeah. and looking back now, whatever the arguments were and the, the vision they were giving that if once it passed, what was gonna happen? I mean, it really did. And it just became like, it just got, it just became another government program, you know, like it just, you know, it just kind of just went. And then so at, over time, I'm now 38 and I've been at the Liberty stuff since uh, basically about, I guess, 08. Um, oh, man. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait. So but, you know, there it seems like there's a lot more time that should be um, 
to counter big government basically is to figure out how to weigh, figure out a way how to build wealth within yourself so you can like counter it. Like you're not going to counter it at the policy level or this. I mean, I guess you can run for office or something, but it just the 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 weight of it is so big that it's so hard to counter. Um, so I, I don't know. I guess my question kind of is um, like looking back at those arguments and 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 now look, you know, you know, looking at it now, it, uh, uh, is it an uphill battle or was it not even a battle and it was just rhetoric at the time? I mean, like, you know, what was going on? You know, well, I, you know, I, I as I said before, you know, government. Some government programs are good. Some government's programs are terrible. You got to figure out at retail uh, which they are. Certainly the one that uh, is taking the biggest chunk of the federal budget right now is Social Security. Uh, It's the major source of income for most retired people in the United States. And quite a lot of people, Social Security is all that they've got. And uh, it means that uh, people are able to have independent households. They don't depend on their children for support. They've got a reliable source of income for themselves. Uh, It is better for women in particular because they don't have to drop out of the labor market to take care of their parents. Uh, Old people uh, generally prefer to live on their own and not in the same house with their children. Uh, The fact that you've got this impersonal entitlement system uh, makes it easier for people to live the kinds of lives that they want to live. So it's a massive program, consumes a significant chunk of gross national product, comes out of your paycheck and so on and so forth. But in fact, it makes people better off and freer because again, because it's just so impersonal and bureaucratic, it's not like a means-tested program where some social worker is going to go trolling through your assets to figure out whether you're entitled or not. You just get it once you reach a certain age. What did you? Uh, um, I was like, what did you think of uh, the Trump checks that came out uh, during the COVID? Like, uh, I thought that was funny because. Uh, you know, I remember all the beef that was brought up about, you know, all these arguments. And when the Trump checks came out, you know, the the side that I mostly hang around with, they were kind of quiet about it. And I was like, hey, what happened? You know, well, you know, not, you know, our side now is passing out uh, basically universal basic income here for a little bit. And and, um, you know, I, I kind of took the, the, the thing like, well, you know what, if they're going to give money out, well, <laughs> you know, might as well get it then. So, you know, you know, it just becomes one of those things. I don't know if uh, well, it's there is bad, that. But, but uh, I mean, COVID uh, is a nice demonstration of both the strengths and weaknesses of uh, libertarian perspectives on government. Certainly, I mean, the weaknesses are on display. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, you know, were pretty much the poster child for the stupid, clumsy bureaucrat. Uh, they uh, insisted that uh, their test for uh, COVID was the only one that could be used. For months, they wouldn't let anyone distribute theirs. Their own one didn't work. Uh, you know, who knows if we could have contained this disease if uh, we'd actually had decent testing, but they screwed it up. On the other hand, uh, you know, we have this vaccine, which is a massive triumph of both big government and big business. Uh, big Pharma had this enormous research capacity government was able to take the risks away by buying a huge supply of it, saying to the companies, you'll make money whether this works or not. And the fact that uh, we came up with this vaccine as quickly as we did is one of the great triumphs of science in human history. (laughs) It's just amazing how fast it happened. it's hard to imagine how uh, the private sector could have done that. Uh, As general, you know, it's because of public schools and government's ability to put restrictions on private public schools that it's been a while since any American has died of the measles or pertussis. We've gotten rid of smallpox. Uh, It's uh, a big government can take some credit for that. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, uh, it's funny because, uh, uh, you know, you can give them credit to like 
Trump, if you if you if if you wanted to be fair for whatever that program oh, yes. was no, called, look, like uh, uh, hey, look, I, I, you know, my politics are clear. I you know I yeah you know, I despise Trump. I think he's awful. But the COVID vaccine is the biggest genuine achievement of his administration, and I have to give him credit for it, even though I don't like him. Let's let's be real. This uh, is just an amazing accomplishment. And had the administration not moved as fast as it did on that it wouldn't have happened because, you know, big pharma alone wouldn't have taken the risk. Yeah. And uh, do you think that, um, uh, uh, so listening to you say that, do you get pushback from people on your side? I mean, um, you know, um, I don't know yeah, who you- A lot uh, of people on the left who don't like capitalism and uh, who think that, uh, you know, we need more central direction of the economy and capitalism produces inequality and so on and so forth. I'm pushing back on people on, on the left as well as the right. When one of the things that uh, differentiates me from a lot of folks on the left is that uh, I think that Hayek's arguments for free markets are powerful and I don't think that they've been adequately assimilated by some people on the left, although if you read carefully, uh, I mean, even somebody as far to the left as Bernie Sanders is basically a uh, welfareist social democrat. He wants, he doesn't want government control of the means of production. He wants a bigger welfare state. He wants better support for the people at the bottom. Yeah. Um... We can argue about the details of uh, that, but you know, I, I, Lenin would be deeply disappointed with Bernie Sanders. Yeah, um, one of the um, uh, uh, coalitions that sometimes, well, not coalitions, but they're different aspects because different states might want it for different things is, in, is like uh, secession. Uh, do you get into the, 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 the value of whether it's a good idea to have, uh, you know, the term right now, I guess they're using more is like national divorce or different things like that. Do you, do you think that there's any value to that or is it just uh, a rhetoric? Yeah. That I, I, I don't talk about it uh, in the book and I think that it's a marginal political movement. Uh, one of the reasons, one, one thing that uh, libertarians are generally in favor of is big free trade zones. Part of what uh, got uh, Hayek and the other early Austrian economist libertarians going in the early 20th century is after World War I, the big Austro-Hungarian empire broke up into little countries that started having trade barriers with each other. This after they'd been devastated by war and the economists looked and they said, this is crazy. You know, this is going to stultify economic growth at a time when there are massive shortages of everything. Uh, part of what's made the United States as prosperous as it is, is uh, the fact that we're all one country. And, you know, it's very easy to move things from one state to another state. Uh, you start breaking it up and, you know, not clear. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, you spoke of, uh, of like the vision and, you know, I, I do, I, I do have a vision of, um, like uh, independent Texas and 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 I, you know, I, I don't try to make it too political. Other than like I just mm -hmm. say that I want uh, Texas to win a World Cup before the United States does. So so you know I think I can unify people through football, but that's like mm -hmm. my vision of how I try to do some of that stuff. But um, uh, but speaking of Texas, and I just wanted to uh, kind of get into one more subject before we talk about your book was uh, and I just want to get your take on it because. I feel you have a fair take on a lot of these uh, issues is uh, like immigration. Uh, mm -hmm. What is uh, kind of the, your, your, your stance that, you know, critiquing both sides because uh, yeah. my dad voted for uh, he, he votes Democrat, but uh, he had said, Oh, I'm doing it only this time because uh, Biden's going to pass immigration reform. And I told him he's not going to do it. It's, it's, it's too, it's too good of a political issue for them to solve, but you know, uh, but, you know, I, you know, it could happen one day. Um, what is your whole take on the whole immigration? Yeah. I don't talk about this at all in uh, the book. Uh, the, uh, the libertarians tend to, as a general matter, be in favor of open borders. Uh, you know, they just want people to be free to move around and uh, transact as they like with one another. Uh, 
quite a lot of what drives the opposition to immigration is the sense that cheap labor is going to drive down the wages in the United States. And so I think that quite a lot of the resistance to immigration comes from people who are concerned about uh, their own standard of living. There are lots of things other than immigration control that you can uh, do about that. And there are uh, the competition that they're worried about doesn't just come from immigration. It comes from foreign imports. Uh, it comes from cheap goods manufactured in China. Uh, and it comes from automation, which is going to happen no matter what. Uh, you know, automobile factories today have far fewer employees than they did 30 years ago because the machines are doing all the work. Uh, so I think that the only way the country has gotten far richer than it was 30 years ago. The problem is that, uh, you know, well, another innovation of uh, libertarian thought has been to uh, facilitate the collapse of labor unions. Uh, working people don't have the kind of political voice they once did. Uh, it would be possible to maintain the kind of uh, secure standard of living that we had 30 years ago. It should be easier. The country is richer. <laughs> uh, we don't have that because of political choices. But the only thing that's going to fix that is a big state. The other aspect of libertarianism that I haven't talked about, I've said that it is bad political philosophy, but it also is rhetorically deployed by people who'd like to be able to hurt other people without the state interfering. Um, I think preeminently the petroleum industry, which uh, has been making money for some time by destroying the planet. And we're going to be seeing more extreme weather and rise in the sea levels in coming years because these guys succeeded in beating back big government. Uh, the first George Bush administration uh, wanted seriously considered a carbon tax. And we'd be in a very different world if they'd succeeded in doing it. But uh, the Republicans have become the party of resistance to any kind of political response to climate change. And that's a kind of corruption too. I mean, there's a tendency of libertarians to focus on the corruption of big government, but there's another kind of corruption when government stands by and doesn't do things that it ought to be doing because someone with influence is stopping them from doing that. Perfect. So let's uh, speak to your book now because uh, I think in your title there, it, it, you're speaking to this right now. So it's mm -hmm. called uh, Burning Down the House, How Libertarian Philosophy Was Corrupted by Delusion and Greed. Um, you were speaking a little bit to the delusion and greed uh, of, of, of that side of the aisle. Can you kind of uh, talk about your book? And, and okay, what sure. Well, they, I take the title, uh, aside from the fact that there's a popular song with that title, uh, from uh, an episode where a uh, fire department, uh, well, I, a county in Tennessee decided that it would privatize uh, fire protection. And uh, so each individual person would get a bill for fire protection. And uh, this uh, guy, was, he was getting older. Uh, one year, he had been paying the fee for years. One year, he forgot. And his grandson burned some trash in his backyard. And it got out of control and spread to his house. And they called the fire department. And the fire department said, sorry, you didn't pay your bill. And so we're not going to come no matter what. And his house burned down. Eventually, they came and sprayed some water on the boundary of his property so that it wouldn't spread to other houses. Uh, and there was a furious debate about whether the fire department had done the right thing. And libertarians were quite clear that, uh, no, we've got to privatize things. Uh, that uh, Glenn Beck did a show uh, you know, defending uh, its decision. We've got to have individual uh, responsibility here. But uh, the guy whose house it was, uh, I think, was entitled to say, well, you know, people, humans sometimes forget. And, you know, I'm getting old. I forget more than I used to. I, you know, and I think it's the fundamental problem with this ideal. And, uh, and I said, it draws two different kinds of people. One are uh, philosophical idealists who have a vision of a world without big government. Uh, but the other is uh, unethical business people who'd like to be able to hurt people without being bothered by the police. And 
the Trump administration was full of that kind of person where you know, the coal industry got to tell the energy department what to do and uh, the chemical industry got to decide what uh, the uh, EPA would do and uh, for coal mining safety was going to uh, be given to one of Trump's biggest donors was a guy who'd uh, gone to prison after uh, a couple of dozen miners got killed in an accident in one of his mines. Um, you, uh, all these folks were very eager to have small government and uh, you know, so one of the big questions here, I guess, is how much do you trust your boss? Yeah, there um, isn't, uh, we, we saw this just recently with the Supreme Court restricting the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Uh, and I'm sure that more restrictions are coming in the future. Uh, it actually costs money to keep your workers safe. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, uh, we, we, are, we have a small constru a family construction business, but so yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And yes, the question is of, I guess it depends on the boss and I know. Mm -hmm. So, but you know what, um, you had mentioned it and I remember you said this, you said when you had went to go work in Louisiana, yeah. that, that, that the bosses would, uh, you know, uh, miss up the math a little bit on the people that might've not catch, they caught it. They cheated their workers, but, many but, of whom didn't have the mathematical skills to know that they were cheating. But, say, some of them did not speak English. But you also said that they, they, were, they were friendly with the cops. Oh, yes. for, so no, for that for that the, reason uh, for that reason so they were you know kind of it, friendly with the state mm -hmm. and so yeah. they had this uh power that they thought yep. they had because you know they were close to they the were state well connected the state officials were not going to bother them so th so there is this weird mm -hmm. action like you know I, I use the term action like uh you know, when you're either gambling or, you know, like I live in a big city. Well, I live in San Antonio, so it's a big city. But yeah. somebody that lives in the rural, I tell them like, well, you know, you just don't like that type of action. You know, there's action in, in, a, in a big city. There's a just yeah. there's all this kind of. So, you know, the action can happen both ways. So even um, it's just, I guess, uh, some of the points that my side would make or maybe I might even say my side, I would say is that, you know, these type of abuses happen and they happen a lot under the 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 blanket of government of you know state power and stuff it like is that. it is bad to have a corrupt government and it is good to have a non-corrupt government non-corrupt government is one of the great achievements of civilization uh it sometimes happens when it happens it can do great things the folks who were developing the vaccines were not looking for opportunities to steal money and put it in their pockets they really wanted to develop a vaccine and they did it uh, that sometimes happens, you know, we, uh, you know, and it's the experience of, you know, quite a lot of us, you know, we drive on roads that, uh, don't turn to jello while we're driving on them, uh, bridges that don't collapse. Uh, you and I are talking, uh, right now because we are connected by the internet, which was, uh, generated with government research. Um, on uh, computers, many of whose components were uh, devised with government funded research. Uh, there is an awful lot of valuable work for a non-corrupt government to do. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for coming on the Los Libertinos. Can you please do the your final plug on when the book will drop and where people can uh, reach you if they wanna read more of your uh, commentary? Uh, so uh, I have a website. Uh, AndrewKoppelman.com, A-N-D-R-E-W-K-O-P-P-E-L-M-A-N, but you the uh, dot com. Uh, I am a professor at Northwestern Law School. So you, if you Google my name at Northwestern Law School, you'll find my email address. I'm happy to talk to anybody about anything. Uh, there is my other reason for writing this book and the reason why you should buy it when it's available, is that libertarianism is a very influential set of ideas in American politics. And I was shocked to discover when I started this research, there is no general introduction to libertarianism available that is at all uh, critical. All of the books about libertarianism that are out there are written by fanboys. So uh, <laughs> getting uh, just a uh, simple account of what is this philosophy? Where did it come from? You know, can we figure out what's living and what's dead and what it has to offer? Um, 
There just isn't another book uh, out there like that. And that's going to change this October. Perfect. Okay, fanboys, don't be fanboys anymore. Buy the book. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Andrew, for coming on. And uh, I hope you feel that I respected your time. And uh, maybe and we this can. This has um, been wonderful. Thank okay, you. And maybe I can have you back on soon. Uh, thank you. Anytime. Thanks right, a lot. Bye. Right. Right, so long.